Hi, Will Hughes back again with the fifth episode in the series on construction procurement. In this video, we'll be looking at contractual networks to see how they differ in the main procurement methods that we've looked at so far. So first up is the diagram that explains the contract contractual network in DBFO or PFI projects. Now, this diagram was um, quite um, revealing when we first developed it in some research many years ago now. I had a, a very good um, postdoctoral researcher from Taiwan called um, Cheng Ping Lin, and um, he developed this diagram in trying to understand the way that PFI contracts worked. And um, it was a very difficult thing to develop the first time that we did it. Um, one of the things that this shows that's quite interesting is um, the different supply chains across the bottom in that um, obviously there's a design team involved in every construction project but typically that's characterized as the architect or the engineer um, and it's very often the case that we simply gloss over the fact that there's a whole advice chain lying behind the design team leader all of whom are tied contractually from different companies into the design process. Obviously, there's a construction supply chain and most of the firms in the construction supply chain are not part of the advice chain. And this is one of the problems with the way that construction is often procured. And there's a facilities management supply chain, again, completely isolated from the other two supply chains, uh, as well as an operational supply chain, the people who are operating the building and using the building on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, whilst they might be in touch with those who are managing the facility, they're almost never in touch with those who built it or those who designed it. So this, the first thing that this contract network shows is the, um, the, the huge divides between those who are involved in designing, building, maintaining and operating buildings. Um, they all seem to be isolated from each other. But as this shows the um, process for private finance initiative, which is um, which is about private financing public sector projects, um, you can see that at the top, the overall client is a public sector client, some kind of government department, and they <clears throat> provide a concession agreement to a joint venture firm. So that company is going to operate a facility on behalf of the government, um, and the government will pay them rent for operating that facility, whether it's a prison or a school, a hospital or a highway or whatever. That joint venture that's going to operate that thing will also design it and build it. And it's usually a firm that it would be set up especially for that purpose. And therefore, in legal terminology, it's called a special purpose vehicle, an SPV. In economic terminology, it's a concessionaire. Same thing, different word from different perspective. And the equity in that firm would be from those who are going to design it, build it and so forth. So you'll see the investors are the main contractor, the facilities managers, the operators and so forth. They would be in a PFI project. They would have been putting in 10 percent of the finance. The other 90 percent would be credit from a lender such as a bank. There are insurance agreements that all have to be in place. The client has advisors who are independent of the construction um, process and the design process as well as independent approvers who are often fulfilling statutory duties to make sure that um, what is being built is in line with regulations and requirements. So this is a complicated network. And the thing that struck me about this, once we'd nailed it down and figured out that this is what was going on in PFI projects, was not so much this, because after all, PFI doesn't exist anymore, but the similarities between this and um, general contracting. So if I flick back and forth between general contracting and this PFI graphic, the only difference is in the name that we give to the client and the agreement between them and the providers of the building. So in general contracting, the provider of the building now is not a joint venture, it's simply a client of construction maybe a property developer or a municipality, a local authority. So the property developer 
will either be selling or leasing the um, constructed facility to end users, occupiers or tenants. Um, so the roles in those two boxes are a little bit different, but the relationships between those roles and everybody else is actually exactly the same. So it was rather startling to discover that PFI, for all of its difficulties, um, was actually very similar to general contracting once you get down to the details of the contracts that people are getting into. And in a similar way, when we started to look at the difference between general contracting and design build, and if I flick between those, the only difference is that the design agreement, instead of being between the design team leader and the construction client, um, in design build is between the design team leader and the main contractor meaning, again, that the rest of the roles don't really change. It's only the relationships between a couple of the key roles. And if we can, if we compare design build to construction management um, and flick back and forth between those two, the main contractor role disappears altogether um, and a construction manager is introduced who represents the client's interests but does not stand in a contractual relationship with the trade contractors who are building the, um, the structure. The trade contractors are in direct contract with the construction client in the same way as the design team leader is and so forth. So again, very few differences. And then finally, in performance-based contracting, this is an identical graphic to the PFI graphic. And so what we see here is that the roles don't change very much. The relationships don't change very much. The, this is a simplified map of the relationships because it only shows a handful of boxes in each chain. In reality, there are possibly several hundred trade contractors in the construction supply chain. Um, many, many more contracts than are shown here. Um, and this graphic is com complex enough, but it's a simplified representation. So what this shows us is that for most participants in a project, the differences between procurement methods are probably really rather slight, um, if not non-existent. So that's not the important thing about the differences. The important thing is that by moving the contracts for key participants around a little bit, then we orient decision makers towards the client's priorities. So for example, a contractor who's paid to bring labour and materials to site is going to be more profitable if they quickly bring their labour and materials to site, get the um, things installed and get finished quickly. But the designer's objective um, isn't simply to get exactly what was documented built. I mean, bear in mind that um, documentation is never complete when we go onto site anyway. But what drives design decision making is very difficult to what drives contractors decision making. And so it's important to think about how the procurement method uh, impacts the priorities for the decision makers. And we need to make sure that they align with the client's priorities for a project. This is why different clients would require different procurement methods. So different procurement approaches have different priorities and roles remain much the same. Okay, that covers that issue. Um, and in the next video, we'll move the arguments on a little more um, and I'll see you there. Okay, cheerio.